Hello and welcome to the Mormon Yeshiva. Um, tonight's uh, presentation is going to be on Nephi's Tower, specifically Helaman 7. Uh, this will be our next in our series of the uh, Beholding Eternity series. And uh, it's going to be it's entitled Exploring the Gate of Heaven because contained in uh, Helaman chapter 7 are sub very sublime and ancient instructions and language that is uh, very unique to the schools of prophetic, but they're very subtle. So we're going to explore some of these this evening. Uh, again, please make note of the fair use disclaimer. Uh, everything here is just for educational purposes only, and I uh, hope that everyone will take it in the spirit in which it was meant. As we approach Nephi chapter 7 in light of what we've been talking about in this series, of beholding eternity. Um, we're talking about the prophetic disciplines of ancient Israel. And one of the most prominent disciplines that many people uh, are, are not aware of is the usage of psalms and lamentations. And at the start of this particular, this particular chapter, um, Nephi, you know, basically announces his lamentation on top of his tower. So let's take a look at here and see exactly why he was lamenting. Well, in this case, it was because the people were condemning the righteous because of, the, you know, because of their righteousness. They were letting the guilty and the wicked go unpunished because of their money. And moreover, to be held in office at the head of government, to rule and to do according to their wills, that they might get gain and the glory of the world. And moreover, that they might more easily commit adultery and steal and kill and do according to their own wills. Sound familiar? Well, it should, because this is our, in many ways the current state of our government. In fact, we're even seeing in our society levels of corruption probably on such an open, uh, in such an open manner that we probably have not seen before uh, in our culture. Now, this iniquity had not come upon the Nephites in the space of not many years. And when Nephi saw it, his heart was swollen with sorrow within his breast, and he exclaimed in the agony of his soul. So the, the phraseology here, swollen with sorrow within his breast, I mean, it is the idea of expressing his, his you know, his emotion, but it's also a very symbolic note of the purpose of a lamentation or a psalm. A psalm can be a psalm of joy, a psalm can be a psalm of sorrow, lamentation can also be a, a psalm of, of sorrow, uh, sometimes a, saw of, a, a psalm of awe. It depends upon the emotion that the writer is trying to evoke. So let's read what says. Oh, that I could have had my days in the days of my father, uh, when my father Nephi first came out of the land of Jerusalem that I could have joyed with him in the promised land. Then were his people easy to be entreated, firm to keep the commandments of God, and slow to be led to do and slow to be led to do iniquity or lawlessness. And they were quick to hearken unto the words of the Lord. Yes, if my days could have been in those days, then my soul would have had joy in the righteousness of my brethren. But behold, I am consigned that these are my days, and that my soul shall be filled with sorrow because of the wickedness of my brethren. Now, it's interesting because when we approach that psalm uh, and we listen to it, there's a part of me that as you, as you read it, you think, I don't know about Nephi, but I do know that I don't remember his people being so easily entreated uh, at the time of Nephi. I mean, if you consider the stories of, of Lemon and Lemuel and their rebellions, I'm not sure it's so easily entreated. But the idea behind the lamentation is it's meant to, to bring sorrow into the heart of the person. And why? Well, just as lamentations bring sorrow and repentance and psalms can be joy and other things, the, the psalms and lamentations are meant to cultivate certain emotions, desires in the heart. And these emotions and desires as we meditate upon the Psalms and Lamentations, as we read them, and especially if we'd had their music, uh, the music of those Psalms with the words, it's meant to invoke in us, you know, passion, desire, and, uh, you know, whether it be sorrow or whether it be joy, um, 
the idea behind it is that is the fuel that fuels, you know, that's the element that fuels our meditations. The desires of our heart, our emotions, our thoughts, all together, be, you know, are in a sense like an offering to heaven. They become a sweet incense. True, true, true godly repentance is a sweet incense, if you will. True godly joy is a sweet offering unto the Lord. So when we approach these things and we see, read Psalms and Lamentations, especially in the idea of prayer and meditation, and the, and the disciplines of the prophetic, these things were additional tools. These things meaning Psalms and Lamentations, whether it be in the Book of Mormon or in the, the Old Testament, like the, you know, the Tanakh, the Book of Psalms, Lamentations, those things, they're meant to be used as a tool to, to cause emotion and joy or sorrow to rise in our hearts in preparation, like it's almost like rocket fuel in preparation to fueling our prayers and emotions. Um, so when we read these things and we meditate upon them, understand that's the purpose or one of the purposes behind these, these Psalms and Lamentations, is they're to invoke or create or stoke the desires of our hearts. And those desires uh, are what rise to heaven. <clears throat> so this brings us to Nephi's enigmatic phrase. And many people often read over this and never see the deep Israelite symbolism in this particular passage. So let's read it first. This is uh, Nephi 7, excuse me, Helaman 7. We'll start at verse 10. And behold, now it came to pass that it was upon a tower which was in the garden of Nephi, which was by the highway, which led to the chief market, which was in the city of Zarahemla. Therefore, Nephi had bowed himself upon the tower, which was in his garden, which tower was also near unto the garden gate, which led by the by which led the highway. Now, at first glance, it's a little reading. I mean, you're meant to get this image of Nephi ascending a tower, but the tower was by a marketplace um, in his garden, if you will, like some of the images you're seeing here, and then he begins to give his lamentation while he's upon his tower. And these people heard these things. However, encrypted into this phrase is, is the process of an ancient meditation as well as an understanding of the process that led the people from calling upon the name of the Lord, like we talked about earlier, to what we would consider a process of translation. Now you say, why is that the case? Well, let's let's explore this particular uh, this particular enigmatic phrase because as we begin to unlock it, you will see that the symbolism behind these things contains much more information meant and preserved for us in these last days. So the first thing we should be looking at is the idea of the tower itself. As in our prior videos here, one of the things we're looking at is the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. It is the idea that when Nephi enters his tower, it is connected with the imagery of calling upon the name of the Lord, yud heh vav -He. The yud heh vav -He, as we've talked about in prior videos, is the idea, that while there is the actual name, the name represents a state or condition. It's a state that is above the prophetic past, the prophetic present and the prophetic future. It is a condition or state of timelessness, something which our physical bodies in this linear world we live in, a very two-dimensional, sometimes almost two and a half dimensional, I think, world that we live in doesn't fully comprehend. But the spirit that is within us does, and it is that part of us which comes from God, which can ascend into that state of timelessness. And that, and that ascension, that energy that is, is fueled by our thoughts, uh, our emotions, and our desires. And that's why we have that lamentation, because in this case, he's using the idea of sorrow as being the fuel for his meditation. In other places, you might see joy as a fuel of, that med of a meditation. But in this case, he's showing the extreme sorrow. You know, the righteous sorrow. You know, blessed are those who mourn. This is the idea of mourning, righteous mourning, uh, for the iniquity of his people. And so we it's meant to us to to 
rise that, you know, raise that flame within us of, of righteous sorrow. And if we look at the, the Sermon on the Mount, we begin, you know, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Aha, comforted, comforter, the Holy Ghost, the Ruach Elohim. So all these things are very intertwined. The very first thing that we discuss here in this particular enigmatic phrase is that he's on his tower. Nephi enters his tower. And what would that mean? In this case, Nephi is that the symbolism of entering his tower is the idea of him entering into that state represented by both baptism as well as the actual meditative process of calling upon the name of the Lord. Now, if you look at it, it says, now behold, it came to pass that it was upon a tower. Okay, this particular the phrase in verse 10 parallels another phrase. Yes, because I have God upon my tower, in verse 14, that I might pour out my soul. Interestingly, soul, one of the fruit words for soul is nefesh, paralleling Nephi. There's also another word, neshema, but that is also used. But you can begin to see the, the poetic expressions in the Book of Mormon. So I began to pour out my soul into my God because of the exceeding sorrow of my heart, because of which is because of your iniquities. In this case, when he, in other words, when, when Nephi is entering his tower, it's a symbol for the heart. So the tower, in a sense, a symbolic sense, is equated to the heart of the person. That's where the person goes within. That's the tower in the sense, the high place, the, the migdal, the high place of your heart. And in this particular section, this is the point, the connecting point, like an altar, the connecting point between the world, this world and the upper worlds. So our heart is where the two worlds connect. And in a symbolic sense, the tower represents a state or condition of entering into the heart and ascending above this mundane world into the upper world and is done through our heart. That's why I say often, you know, prophets and apostles and, and other things like that may hold the keys of church and, and, and authority, but only the individual holds the keys to their own heart. Even the Lord doesn't force his way in. He stands at the door knocking. And those who open unto him, you know, he will then come in. Well, it's the same concept. You hold the keys to your heart. Therefore, it's up to you to turn the doorknob and unlock it so that the Lord can come in. But in this case, the tower is also equal to Yehovah. So as we said, it's a symbol of a state or condition that represents something above this linear timeline of past, present, and future. It's the idea of entering into an upper world where our spirit is connected to God's spirit, a connection which can only be severed by our own choice. So he goes into this particular state of consciousness, the state of being, the state of calling upon the Lord, a state of deep contemplative meditation and prayer. Okay, and notice that was which was in the Garden of Nephi. The tower was in the Garden of Nephi. Well, it's an interesting play on words here, which was in the Garden of Nephi. Garden of the soul, the Eden of man, a pattern of the heavenly Eden above. Our soul, Nefesh, the Garden of the soul. Nefesh is equal to soul. So he's in his garden. Well, the garden of the soul is the Eden of man. And if we understand the nature and the design of the tree of life, if we ourselves are living trees of life, then the area of the garden of Eden for us symbolically, again, is our heart. So in our hearts are where the changes internally are created through spiritual acts of faith. And, and, and as those things begin to take root in the heart, they produce or manifest in the outer world. But it's the idea that the human body is a pattern of the heavenly Eden, but specifically the Eden is that in the heart. Now we're talking in a very spiritual or symbolic sense. It's not that there is not a literal Eden. It's just in this case, he's using it to describe a prophetic discipline. Okay which was by the highway. Now here we begin to get some interesting Hebrew plays on words and connections that are often overlooked. The idea of a highway comes from the Hebrew word mesela, meaning step, pathway, or steps, or terrace. It actually comes from the Hebrew word salah, which is the root word for sulam, meaning ladder, as in Jacob's ladder. So 
the symbol of going within the heart, going in the tower, calling upon the name in the Garden of Eden, is now followed by which is next to the highway, which is by the highway, or by or close to or in connection with this highway or this, in actuality, a ladder or a terrace step, meaning a pathway. So he's saying, hey, once you enter the heart, there is a pathway here, a pathway of ascension that you are meant to understand and traverse. And you can see this connection in Genesis 28, 12, where the word salam, ladder, is used in regarding to Jacob's ladder, where it says, and he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set upon the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God, and, he, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending upon it, or on it. So the idea is that there's a connection with Jacob's ladder, and the highway that Nephi is describing while he's in his tower. So all this is beginning to paint a picture. While we think of a highway like something that we would drive on, their idea of highway, which is also a path, it can be steps, like the steps of a ladder or a terrace. You know, something that is terraced. But the idea is that prophetically it's tied to the image of Jacob's ladder. So he's giving us this idea, this, this he's beginning to paint more of this picture of how a person ascends, how they go with, you know, they start up by calling upon the name. They enter into that condition. They go within the heart. And then they begin to do what? They approach the highway or Jacob's ladder. But then he has a very interesting wordplay that begins to start taking place and he begins to demonstrate. So let's read the entire thing again and let's make note of actual some of the words that we want to make sure we pay close attention to. It says, and behold, now it came to pass again that it was upon a tower which was in the garden of Nephi, which is by the highway, Mesela, which led to the chief market, Sha'ar, which was in the city of Zarahemla. Therefore Nephi had bowed himself upon, upon the tower, which was in his garden, which tower was also near unto the garden gate. Remember, Eden had gates. There in, 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 in Israelite theology of the ancient world, there were, there were gates of heaven. So unto the garden gate, Sha'ar, it's also interesting that you see this, the, this Hebrew wordplay and almost po poetic rhyming taking place because a chief market or marketplace, a Sha'ar, and a gate, Sha'ar, are basically the same thing, but hitting on their context. Because usually the marketplace in a city usually took place after you entered to the gate of a city. But also a chief marketplace is a place of where in, in Hebrew symbolism of the prophetic, it is a symbol for the place where wisdom is exchanged or received. So in, a, in this case, as we, as we go through this, we see Nephi bowed himself in humility upon the tower or symbolically entering into calling upon the name and going within the garden, which was in his heart, which towers also near the garden gate, the Sha'ar. Now the Sha'ar is important. It's a very important word because it has other connections. And we're going to show one of those very important connections in relation to translate to the doctrines of translation, which led by the highway, Misila. And so in this case, we have some Hebrew word plays here that we there, you know, as we approach the text, we want to pay closer attention to because there's more going on here than meets the eye. So here we begin to see, and this is where I want us to play close attention to, a Hebrew rhyme and play on words. Therefore Nephi had bowed himself upon the tower, which was in his garden, which tower was also near unto the garden gate, the Sha'ar, which led by the highway. Here the garden gate is also paralleling and is connected to the highway. There's a gate and then there's a highway. Well, the highway, as we talked about, was a ladder, but there's also a gate. What is that gate? So as we've noted, there is a connection between the idea of a gate and the highway, but there's also something even more ancient and sublime encoded into the text. In the Hebrew prophetic, it is understood that words that sound the same, but are different only by one letter, have a relationship. And more specifically in the prophetic, one letter can be that is the same sound as another letter, such as shin or samech, 
Because they both have the S sound, one could be replaced for the other. In this case, we see an actual encryption word play here. It's a very ancient uh, teaching about the idea of the gate and a whirlwind. In Hebrew, a gate, sha'ar, shin ayin resh. In Hebrew, whirlwind is sa'ar, samek ayin resh. So while one is a samek, starts with the samek, the other starts with the shin, the idea is because they have the same sound, one, you can actually replace one with the other and get the hidden meaning. So this happens many places in scriptures where you'll see words that are almost identical, but with one letter. And when they sound the same, then you, it, it is understood in the prophetic disciplines that one can be replaced with another, or at least has a relationship. In this case, we see a relationship between the concept of a gate and a whirlwind. But this is not just any regular whirlwind here. There's something else hidden in this context of sa'ar, uh, or a sha'ar gate, or a sa'ar whirlwind. It's a special kind of whirlwind. And what is it? Well, in this case, the gate and the whirlwind are related. It's the idea of Elijah. And, it, and this is found in verses of, excuse me, Second Kings, verses, uh, chapter 2, verses 1 and 11. And here we see Elijah taken up by a whirlwind, a sa'ar, into heaven. Let's read this closely and see what actually happened? And it came to pass when the Lord would take would, when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, Sa'ar, that Elijah went from with Elisha from Gilgal. And it came to pass, as they, Elijah and Elisha, still went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire, a Merkavah in Hebrew, and horses of fire, and parted with them both asunder parted them both asunder, and Elijah went up in a whirlwind, a sa'ar, into heaven, or a gate. In many ways, it's the idea of a sa'ar is something that, while we think of like a funnel cloud, it's the idea of a, that's connected to the idea of a gate. He went in a gateway, sometimes referred to as a doorway, a gate, a portal, whatever you want to call it, a conduit of some type into heaven. So in this prophetic description that Nephi is giving about his tower in his garden, which was by the highway, excuse me, which was by the highway, um, which led, which was by the garden gate. He's also giving us an idea or an explanation of the concept of how Elijah was translated, that he was able to open this whirlwind, this, this portal, this conduit, this gate, you know, whereby it commences with the idea of calling upon the name, and then these people grow into this type of relationship and condition where they can literally become translated or ascend like Elijah, Enoch, and many others. So in this case, the idea of the whirlwind and the gate, in a sense, are related and, and they can be replaced one with the other. So in this case, when we see Nephi, you know, giving us these descriptions, he's actually starting off of, 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 a, of an instruction on how to call upon the name, where a person goes within, how it leads them up to ascending the ladder, of Jacob's ladder, how it opens up into the chief marketplace, and of course, uh, that it was done by a gate, or a whirlwind, or a sa'ar, or a gateway, like I said, a conduit of some type, which was related to how Elijah was taken to heaven. Now, in this case, let's take a look and see now if we can distill a more modern meaning on some of this into our current language. And so I hope you'll give me a little license here just to kind of filling in some of the concepts or the ancient words. Now we're going to take some of the symbol out and put a little bit more of our common tongue on it so we can perhaps better understand what he's saying. And behold, now it came to pass that it was in the state or condition of calling upon the name. In other words, Nephi had entered the state of condition of calling upon the name, which was in the garden of his or the soul, which was by the steps of Jacob's ladder, which led to the steps of Jacob's ladder, which led to the chief marketplace, you know, where wisdom is exchanged, which was in the city of Zarahemla. Strangely enough, there's actually a relationship between Zarahemla and the constellation Taurus. Therefore, Nephi had humbled himself in the condition or state of calling upon the name, which was in his garden, 
of his soul, which calling upon the name led unto the soul's conduit, portal, whirlwind, gateway, if you will, the whirlwind conduit or portal, by the ascending of Jacob's ladder, the ladder of heaven. So I know it sounds strange to us, but these are the concepts meant to be, you know, from a prophetic discipline, uh, from, from the, from the approach of the prophetic, you know, arts, if you will, of ancient Israel, this was how a person ascended Jacob's ladder to enter into the gate of heaven. Now, this isn't all, but it gives us an idea of a pattern and a progression of how a person was to approach the meditations contained in the book of Helaman so that they could do what? Well, the idea is, is we commence having a, you know, calling upon the name. We are purified by fire. You know, we are given instructions on how to ascend. Then once that occurs, and as we continue, we learn, you know, we come into contact next, which we'll run the next session on the language of angels until we even reach the sun. So we can see a progression from in a sense of like baptism, administration of angels, all the way to receiving the Son of God. So in a sense, we're getting very symbolic instructions couched in the language. Now, you might say, why are you making the, the uh, connection between Zarahemla and the constellation Taurus? Well, in the ancient in ancient Israel, the constellation Taurus was connected to the, was actually and connected to the mountain of the Lord's house. In other words, uh, you know, the Aleph, the sign of the bull, led you know constructed part of the name of El, and in the ancient in ancient Israel, the constellation Taurus was considered the mountain of the Lord's house, and in the sense of a constellation was also a mountain. Now, there are other symbols for mountains as well. They can be nations or people, but constellations like Taurus and others also governed nations. So there was a lot of relationships going on between the heavens, the nations here, and the events here. And so much of the symbolism is interconnected. And so how would you know? Well, in Mosiah 25, 23 to 24, we actually get a little more insight into the land of Zarahemla. Now there were in, there were seven churches in the land of Zarahemla, and it came to pass that whoever, whosoever was desirous to take upon the name of Christ or of God, they did join to the churches of God, and they were called the people of God. And the Lord poured out His Spirit upon them, and they were blessed and prospered in the land. The idea is that there were seven churches. The the the, the symbolism of seven churches. Seven women, seven prophetesses. They go by various names in the Israelite prophetic. Uh, seven candlesticks. Um, while they can be related to uh, things here on earth, one of the symbols is that is that of the Pleiades in the heavens. So in this sense, you'll see that the seven lampstand menorah in the house of the Lord, or the tabernacle in the wilderness, was a symbol on a galactic scale, if you will, of the Pleiades. Okay, that sounds strange to us. There are also have other symbols, excuse me, symbolisms, depending upon your point of reference. So, from a from a uh, idea of the Maserot or the the zodiac, if you will, the mountain, <clears throat> the mountain or constellation of the Lord's house. One of which, of course, there were many, but the one Lord's house was, of course, uh, you know, the constellation Taurus, with the seven churches or the seven branches or the seven women being the seven stars of the Pleiades. Where was it placed? Well, this same, this particular men the menorah was placed inside the holy place. So the tabernacle in the wilderness has a galactic like paradigm that you're meant to understand. Each of these things, the, alt the horned altar, the, you know, the idea of the Pleiades, the, the table of showbread and all these things were connected to things above in the heavens, which contains the idea of as above, so below, with here below being a pattern or patterning things here off what is above. Now, there were other mountains, just like there were other, you know, houses, if you will. But the idea at this time, and at least in this place, the mountain of the Lord's house was equated to the constellation Taurus. Now, to be fair, from a more local idea, we also have the idea that of the seven planets of the week in the ancient world. Now, here's another thing. From our planet, we could also take a look at the sun, the moon, Mars, Mercury, Jupiter, Venus, or Saturn as also being 
from from our point of view and the closest stars that we can see in our system these would be the also those seven stars as well they could be symbols for that depending on the orientation and the context of how, how that symbol is used in this case in the city of Zarahemla um, I, I lean more towards the constellation Taurus because it's the idea of the actual Lord's house. It's not that you're worshiping stars, obviously. It's the idea that uh, you, these, these symbols are connected to things in the heaven. So that a pattern below is also representative of the pattern above. You know, and so that those things on earth as they are in heaven. This is why you see that connection. So I, I'm not trying to tell anybody to get into star worship. It's the idea that these things were connected. So that people, they would actually, in the ancient world, go on a mountaintop. And some of these disciplines, they would actually, you know, visualize or view the night stars, such as the Pleiades or the constellation Taurus, sometimes the constellation Orion and other things. Um, there were several major constellations. But they would use that as a place of, uh, of a point of reference or point of focal point. Uh, not that they're worshiping it, but it was part of a meditative practice or a practice of prayer. Like a person was focusing on that, but not praying to it, but the idea of using it as a tool or a, a way of, of uh, helping them to visualize and connect things. In this case, though, um, you know, we see a connection, though, between the constellation Taurus and the Mount of the Lord's house and the city of Zarahemla because there were seven churches in the land of Zarahemla. Now, this will continue next time, but we're going. To, I want to introduce you to the idea of the phraseology of certain men. Prophets, the prophets in Israel used these techniques that, such as Nephi is describing, of calling upon the name, you know, going upon your tower into your heart, about humbling yourself, calling upon the name, and entering into this condition or state of bondedness or oneness with God. And while doing that, they were able to ascend Jacob's ladder. Jacob's ladder, but doing that, you know, it opened, you know, there was a gateway to it. There was a portal or conduit, which allowed them to enter in and go to the chief marketplace, which in many ways, your chief marketplace is, is a symbol in ancient Israel of um, the place where wisdom is exchanged. Okay. And why do I say that? Well, there are many symbols in the Torah for buying and selling. Come by, you know, um, milk without you know money without milk, milk without money and meat without price or you know or like even in the book of revelation where it talks about um a certain mark upon you know the mark, we often call it the mark of the beast upon the hand of someone or their forehead and then it says you know there's the number of a man it is the number of his name here is wisdom you know that no man could buy or sell and it says and then here is wisdom that buying and selling symbol is connected to the idea of the exchange of wisdom so it's the same thing here when you have a chief marketplace it is the place where wisdom you're going to the chief marketplace where wisdom is exchanged as if it were a city or a celestial city but these prophets were certain men and nephi begins to create a symbol here and a story about specific certain men and it starts in Helaman 7 and 11, but it continues later into 8 and 9. But specifically, he says, And it came to pass that there were certain men passing by, and saw Nephi as he was pouring out his soul unto God upon the tower. And they ran and told the people. So in a sense, while there were certain men who probably passed by Nephi on this tower, there were also certain men, who are later identified as prophets, who saw using this same pattern and, and uh, technique or discipline of bondedness with God, this is how they obtain the witness and testimonies that they had. And so they began, they ran and told the people what they had seen. The question is, who are these certain men? And the people came together in multitudes that they might know the cause of so great a mourning for the wickedness of the people. So as you look forward in the chapter, and we'll discuss this, in more detail the next time is the idea of who are these certain men and what were they learning and why are they connected with this prophetic discipline and their identities will be quite telling because the story of, of Helaman goes on to explain who these five certain men were but it's couched in very sublime language
So I hope you've enjoyed this this evening. This is, again, the discussion of Helaman 7, next in the in the series of our Beholding Eternity series. And uh, I hope this has edified you and uh, that you've enjoyed. Thank you and have a good evening.